So, uh, man, I just want to say that the body collectively of Christ is amazing. So yesterday, uh, I got a call from Alex, like there's some sick, their family's sick and like, like pretty sick. And so be praying for them. Um, uh, the, not like deathly ill, praise God, but they're definitely sick. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't, we ain't got nothing for, I can't be there for worship. And so I'm like, we got to find somebody. We got to figure this out. Like what's going on? I'm not doing the acapella thing no more, guys. That, that, that was a pre-launch thing and that is not happening anymore. Okay. Like I did that for a season. I've retired from music. Um, I guess you have to be in music to retire from it. I, but, but, uh, so, um, man, I just like, I put calls out to everybody I could think of. And so long story short, Gary and Kristen Young from Bethany were able to be like, we got you. We can play whatever you need us to play, do whatever you need us to do, be wherever you need us to be. So thank you for you all for joining us this morning. It's great to have you. That's a beautiful example, by the way, of what we want to be as a church, right? Like we want to build here God's kingdom and be able to send out, right? Whether it's for a Sunday morning or whether we're sending somebody across the globe to plant another church, that's what cooperation is all about, right? It's that we needed help. They answered because they're our parent church and they knew that we needed some help and they helped. Thank you to Kevin. They rearranged their whole thing. Patrice stepped in for a kid's church so Kevin could sing because they're watching some of the toe wake. It's a whole thing. The body is just moving and it's awesome to see that type of help. And uh, so thank you all for being here and thanks for, I hope, uh, I'm gonna tell you, they worshiped. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, this, whole, this whole next phase with the word can kind of lift, <laughs> measure up to the bar. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. So um, listen, next week I'm out. That's the only announcement. And Kevin is actually going to be preaching for us next week. So definitely come show him some love. Uh, excited about that. I will catch it on the replay. It's our 10 year anniversary and we are out. So, okay. <laughs> we are out. We finally get, we never had a real like honeymoon. So we're kind of like, we've been saving for like a hundred years. And so we're going to have some fun this week. All right. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I feel like 10 years was, was one to do it. You know, 10 years, that's, that's awesome. That's, hey, listen. So um, we are concluding our series, Misunderstood, this week, right? Our coffee cup verses, our cultural slogans, the things we hear and are often misquoted. Uh, the last couple weeks we've given out prizes. Now, the Hackett's aren't here, so I can't give them their coffee mug. I'll give it to them when I'm back. Uh, but we have one from a few weeks back for the Campbells that uh, they were MIA for a little bit. But I got your, uh, your little wall hanging here. This is the one from uh, where two or three are gathered. I don't know if you're going to even like it. But, brother, it is yours, so come on down and grab that prize, okay? <laughs> this is from where two or three are gathered. You know? There he is also. All right. There you go. Perfect for your office. There you go. There you go. Your clawfish. You know. All right. This week, no prizes this week, but have you ever heard someone say, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart? You know where that's from? Anybody know where that's from? Got any takers? Psalm 30. Psalm 30 that's it. Psalm 37. If I had another prize, Thunga would have won another one. I'm telling you. <laughs> Our kids director would be in her word. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, Psalm 37, you know, and, um, the verse is often quoted to make people feel better when they're down, you know, um, often very, very, very well intended. Uh, maybe if someone's worried about money, worried about a new job, they want a husband or a wife, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes it's, uh, used for backdoor pride, right? It's like, man, I love to see what the Lord has done for your business. Yeah, the Lord gives you the desires of your heart. It's like a backdoor pride, like, yeah, you see all the Lord has given me. It's usually very, very well intended, so we're not cracking on it. If you have a coffee mug or a wall hanging, or you tell people the Lord will give you the desires of your heart, remember, these things are not inherently false. Let's just look at the context a little bit. Some would say that the Lord giving you the desires of your heart means anything you want and desire, the Lord will give you, and it's just not always true. It's just not always true. So we will be in Psalm 37, if you have your Bible. We'll be in the first 11 verses. I'm not going to cover the whole psalm today. Uh, we will have the words on the screen if you need them. So to keep in mind, before we get started, this is a psalm. 
Genre is incredibly important. I was just sitting with on a Zoom call with our, our upcoming ID groups, our community groups leaders, and we were talking about hermeneutics or Bible interpretation, what it means to interpret the scriptures accurately in their proper context and the proper way to do it. Genre can be extremely critical, is extremely critical to how we interpret a text. Psalms are poems or songs. They're po it's a poetic book, poetic, a collection of music and poems. And there's a lot of emotion in it. There's a lot of figurative language. There's some literal languages, but all that can dictate how we understand the message being presented. Do we take this literally? Do we take that figuratively? How do we apply it? What's the practical meaning to all that we're reading? I like the example of David. Psalm 55, I think it is. David asks uh, God to hand his enemies over to death, to send them down to Sheol alive. I don't think the application to that text is we should pray for our enemies to go to hell alive and be burned up. I don't think that's the application that he intended with that. And that doesn't, I think of when Jesus, the disciples said, should we call down fire from heaven? And Jesus is like, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. Chill. Your Bible doesn't say chill. But that's what he was saying. Relax. You don't know what I'm putting in you. All right, so we have to know that David is emotionally charged in that moment. His enemies are pursuing him. He's desperate. He's crying out to God for help. So in Psalm 37, David's writing a song about God not neglecting his saints in light of the wicked, in light of all the evil that we see going on around him and the wicked, wicked prospering. Uh, we're going to take these first 11 verses. And in these first 11 verses, you talk about not fretting. The word fret means to be angry, agitated, or irritated with the wicked. But rather, look to the Lord. So let's pray. Let's hop in. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would draw nearer to you today with our whole hearts, with our whole minds, with all of our strength. We would learn to love you better solely because of your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's tackle these first two verses. Mine titles this psalm, He Will Not Forsake His Saints, a psalm of David. It says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like green herb. Fret. Don't fret. Anybody have a different word in their Bible for fret? You can shout it out if you do. If you don't, no worries. Fret, again, is to burn with anger, be agitated or irritated. Don't get consumed with anger and irritation over wicked folk or wicked things that you see going on in the world. Don't let it bother you, consume you, or worry you too much. That word wickedness. Wickedness is tough to look at. Seeing wrong, seeing evil is hard to watch. It can make you feel mad, worried, or some kind of spectrum of those emotions all at the same time. But again, this verse is saying, don't let it consume your thoughts. You see it, acknowledge it, it's there. If you've ever watched the news, <laughs> pick on the news all the time, but I'll be honest with you, I think the news deserves to be picked on, okay? That's, that's my opinion, all right? That's not fact, that's not in your Bible either. But if you watch any news, it's inevitable you will see evil, you will see wickedness, you will see things that bother you and worry you and concern you. Fret not. Don't get too agitated. Don't get too worried. Don't be too bothered by it. Why? Second half of that verse, or verse two, I should say, they're going to fade like grass and wither away. See, why not worry about all the evil you see? Because a day is coming when God is going to deal with all of that. Soon the wicked will fade. Soon evil will be completely put away. It fades like the grass. How many of y'all got a yard, a lawn that you mow? I don't. I live in an apartment, but I watch them mow the lawn every week. <laughs> I just watch them fly by on their giant standing tractors. And when you mow the grass, if you don't collect the shavings, what happens to the grass? Withers up, turns that yellowish color first, and then like a 
10 or something. And when I was a kid, telling on myself a little bit, I would like to collect grass and burn it with a magnifying glass. See, real dry, withered grass burns up. Jesus said it's good for the fire. Look, we should not wish that on anyone, to be very clear. However, the reason God gives through the psalmist here to not be overly concerned with the evil we see is that he's dealing with it. He has ultimately dealt with it in the person of Jesus, inwardly, in each of us. He's dealing with it in the earth through what Christ has done. And when he returns, he will ultimately deal with it. And there will be no more evil. There will be no more wicked. And the interesting part is we can look out at the evil and the wicked. and We can wag our fingers and have all these things to say. But do you know ultimately what the answer to our wagging finger is? It is the gospel. When we see the evil and the wicked around us, God has provided a means to change a wicked and evil heart into one that glorifies him, that lives to worship him. I think this moment of worship and song we had this morning was so beautiful. And we're singing, to worship you I live, I live to worship you. That cannot be exclusive to us in this room. I desire to see every soul in Columbia saying, to worship you I live, I live to worship you. Every soul in the region, every soul around the world, it's God's will that none should perish, that none should be stuck in their evil, and that none should wither away. Is that our focus? Is that what drives us? Man, I don't, I don't want to see the wicked fade and wither away. I want to see him yelling, to worship you, I live, I live to worship you. So the response to evil is the gospel. But it's why you shouldn't be worried, because eventually evil will be put away. And every soul that gets saved, that's a little more evil being put away. That's a little more wickedness being put away. And it should drive us. It should drive us to proclaim the gospel because he is coming back. And he is going to deal with the wicked, and it will not be pretty. I done said all that and forgot to give you the carry out. <laughs> the first carry out is don't worry about the wicked. <laughs> don't worry about the wicked. <clears throat> Got a little ahead of myself. A little ahead of myself. I will say one thing though. You know, your thoughts can be consumed by what you put your eyes on, right? What that whole, like what you look at mo longest becomes strongest kind of philosophy, right? There's some truth to that. You know, you ever sit down and watch like Dateline or 60 Minutes? You ever watch that? If you watch enough of those, you think somebody's coming after you. You're convinced. You're convinced. You don't want to open up the door at night because they're waiting in the house. You don't want to leave the house because they're waiting in the bushes. Like you, <laughs> you watch enough Dateline, they're coming for you. There's a principle there. If you binge like a Netflix show, all of a sudden like you feel like you're in the universe with them. You're like, oh, Lori got got, you know, like, oh, I'm so, I'm, you like mourn someone that's not real. It's like you're just consumed by it. You just focus on it. You're just looking at it all the time. You watch the news, you just, the same thing. It's like, oh, like I never want to go back to Baltimore again, ever. You watch the news, it's like, Never, right? Conversely, if we focus on the Lord like that, like, yeah, okay, here he comes getting hyper-spiritual. But listen, hear me out. If we would focus on God and his word like that, imagine how much he could consume us. Imagine how much our thoughts and desires and actions could be attuned to his. Because I can listen to some song or watch some movie and start acting like something I'm not. Man, what if I start looking at this and acting like something I'm not? I'm not righteous by myself. I'm not holy by myself. But if I start looking at something and then looking at myself in the mirror, start acting like something I'm not, maybe someday I'll become what he wants me to be. All of a sudden, I'm walking through life and stuff's coming. And it's pinging off on me because I'm walking in the fruit of the spirit. That was the kids. That's the kids verse this month, right? Fruit of the spirit is love, joy. Peace. Yeah. Walking in the spirit. But that's where David encourages us to go next. 
Verses 3 to 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself. Here it is. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in the Lord. Put your faith and confidence in him completely, in his abilities, his character, his track record. If you don't have a track record with him, there's a 66 books of track record right here. I promise you get deep enough in these 66 books, you'll have a track record with him also. Trust him. Remember we talked about the parachute, right? Trusting like a parachute. You don't jump out of a plane without your parachute buckled. If you do, you're in trouble. That's how we need to trust Jesus. That's what trusting the Lord means with my life, with my very being. And he says, do good. You old do-gooder. Bible tells you to do good. So if you're like, you're just a do-gooder, like praise God. <laughs> praise God. Living out Psalm 37. Do good. It means what you think. Behave properly. Act right. Do what you know to be right. Be the right person. Live in the call that Jesus is calling you to. The call to himself, to be pure, to be righteous, to be holy in Christ Jesus. Dwell in the land. Man, live a quiet life. Just don't go out there causing a bunch of chaos. Be content with what he's given you. Live the life he's called you to. Befriend faithfulness. Man, I love that. Befriend faithfulness. You know, he's kind of repeating himself, right? This is a psalm. They kind of, they repeat. Befriend faithfulness means practice faithfulness in your life. Especially as it pertains to faithfulness to God. But faithfulness anywhere else too. If you're in a marriage, practice faithfulness. You have a friendship, practice faithfulness. Practice faithfulness. Befriend faithfulness. This is calls to contentment with God. Contentment with what God has given you. Contentment with where you are. Dwell in the land he's called you to. And that got Israel in trouble sometimes, right? The journey to the promised land lacked a lot of contentment. Got them in a lot of trouble. A lot of wanderings for a lot of years, a lot of pain and anguish. Be content with where he has you. And then this is the verse, delight in the Lord. This is a high degree of pleasure or mental satisfaction in the Lord. Let your delights and affections be for him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Come on, we delight ourselves in a lot of things. Hear the Lord saying, delight yourself in me. This is a call to satisfaction in the Lord. And this should be the aim of our life. That all our affection, all our satisfaction and pleasure would be found in him. To give our minds and hearts over to him. You know the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his glorious face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. To behold him is to see everything else fade. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more pure. There's nothing that deserves our affections more. Nothing that deserves, no one that deserves our delights more than Jesus. And then there's the verse, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. See, what's often left out when we quote this verse is the first part. See, we want the desires of our heart, but we don't want to delight in the Lord. We want to delight in a lot of things and then get the desires of our heart, when most of the time the things don't have anything to do with him. What do we delight in? See, the problem with wanting the desires of our heart apart from Jesus is our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Your heart will dupe you right into sending yourself straight to hell. But if we delight in him, all of a sudden our desires are molded to him. Our heart aligns with what's important to him, with what he loves, with what he wants to see, not just in us, but in the earth. Now those things become way more important 
than the foolish things my heart used to try to trick me into. This is not a promise that we get everything we want. And that's where it's often misquoted. Just desire something in your heart, rub the magic lamp of the Bible, pray, and God will answer you. That is not this. See, if we can't trust our deceitful hearts apart from him, then it takes something else, that surgical move of the spirit, separating bone from marrow, penetrating the deepest parts of our heart. And then when our heart is in Christ, found in Christ, it becomes tamed, transformed, conformed into his image. Those are the desires and prayers that God answers. Those are the things he wants us to pray. And this isn't about some material success or some temporal thing. I want you to think about Solomon. Solomon loved the Lord. Solomon had his issues later, but when Solomon has this moment where the Lord asks him to essentially ask for whatever he wants, he asks for wisdom to lead his people. See, his heart was attuned to God. Why would God not want you to be wise to lead his people? Now, God being rich in mercy and rich in love gave Solomon all the riches in the world. But that's not what his desire was. See, I believe in part it was the riches that did Solomon in. See, if that good gift don't stay in God, it could cause you big trouble. Can you imagine being the richest, most wise person in the world? That could make you the most wealthy, manipulative person that the world has ever seen. We see some of them. He prayed for wisdom. Attuned to God's heart, he prayed for wisdom and he received it. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. According to his will. How do you find out God's will? And not the whole God's will for your life, but God's will. What he wills, what he desires in the earth. Man, his word and prayer. We find out who God is, what his desires are. And when we ask according to his will, according to his desires, he hears us. And when the scripture said God hears you, he's answering. Ultimately, this whole thing is about our hearts having longings and desires. Desires outside Christ are misplaced and desires in Christ go toward what they should be. And then our hearts are ultimately satisfied in him. Our next carry out, delighting in the Lord satisfies our hearts. Delighting in the Lord satisfies our hearts. They long, they have longings. Do your, does your heart have longings? Longings aren't bad. Strong desires, that's what we mean by longings. Things you want to see in your life, in the earth. We all do. And many of them are good, and most of them are well-intended. But is your primary longing for the person of Jesus? Like, is that primary? Is that the bedrock? Is that the foundation of the longings and desires of your heart? Is it him? Because Jesus is by far the most satisfying thing, being, person in all of the cosmos. Nothing is more satisfying than Christ. No drug, no person, no family, no work, no money. Nothing we could attain to is more satisfying than him. And see, when our primary desire, our primary longing is for him, some of those things I mentioned that are good things, like not drugs, but like family and money to provide for yourself, fitness level, like whatever it is, some of those things are good things. But when Christ is the primary longing and primary desire, they're just fit in their proper place. Man, these longings, they desire, they long, and they will worship idols if we let them. See, our hearts long for an infinite God. And everything we place those longings in on earth is temporary. Infinite longings for an infinite God. Temporal longings that can never satisfy what he's put in us. Our hearts are set for eternity. And he's the only eternal one. All 
All right. Verses 5 to 11, we're going to read. Now, this is kind of going to reemphasize some of what he's already said. He says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Multiple times. Don't fret over that. Don't fret over that. And then he says, fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Us getting worked up and agitated and frustrated and worried over the things that tends us toward evil. We're mad at that and then become the very thing we're mad at. We become the thing we're consumed with. It tends only to evil toward evil. Verse 9, for the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. You see what he says there? Fretting gets you nowhere. All the frustration, the worry, the consuming thoughts, it gets you nowhere. And sometimes you become the thing you hate and at the end, it all fades away. Don't be those who fade away. Because it's all passing away. The evildoer will be cut off. It is all going to change and changing as we speak. But the meek, those who are humble, those who seek the face of God in submission and humility, they will inherit the land. They will inherit the promises of God, the coming of God's kingdom, that already not yet kingdom, the one that came with Jesus, but is still coming as Jesus comes. And they will delight themselves in abundant peace. Man, how many of us just sometimes just want peace? <laughs> Man, we know how to hustle and bustle. We know how to worry. Man, just peace, just peace in the earth, peace in our home, peace in the neighborhood, peace. Oh, it's amazing. The Bible just gives you these like clear things. Like if you delight yourself in the Lord, if you are still and wait patiently for him, if you refrain from anger over the things you see and you just allow God to be God, the end result of that is his inheritance and abundant peace. Man, in a world like ours, wars and rumors of wars and famines and diseases and financial crises and elections and busyness and abundant peace. See, that's how he ties it together in this first half, -ish, first third of the psalm. It's that those who just delight in him, focus on him, who place their attention on him. Don't get consumed with the way, hey, remember Peter walking on the water? He's straight as long as he's looking at Jesus. Then he gets consumed with the waves around him, the stuff going on, and he starts to sink. And all he had to do was just stay focused on Jesus. And I know that this can sound like such a hyper-spiritual, non-practical answer. It's like, there's a lot of waves, dude. Like, I know, I know, I know, I know there are. And there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of things beyond our control, right? But look back on your life. When did just obsessing with those things ever produce positive results? It just doesn't. Sometimes the solution is not always a tangible thing. Right? It's not always something you can taste and touch. Sometimes the tangible solution is the abundant peace in the middle of the storm. When your heart is just calm. And it doesn't really make any sense. But there's love and joy and peace and patience 
faithfulness, gentleness. And there's no law against those things. See, the desires of our heart in Christ are put there by God. And because he's trustworthy, when we're in him, when we're with Jesus, when we remain in the vine, like he encourages us in John 15, because apart from him, we can do nothing. But when we remain in him, it would be his good pleasure to give us the desires of our heart because he himself desires those things also. See, when you're in him, you no longer want to pray for meaningless things that are fading away. I remember praying to God before I knew him to be rich. And I became a church planter. <laughs> I don't want my family to struggle, but I would much rather be poor and know Christ than rich and not know him. I'm not poor. Because my financial status has nothing to do with my richness of spirit. I just want us to know that the desires of our heart in Christ are pure and good because of him. So keep delighting yourself in the Lord and pray for the desires he puts in your heart and watch him respond. Verse five does give a promise. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will act. Let's go to our next steps. If you have your phone, go ahead and hit our QR code. Our next step, A, this is your reflection question. Do you delight in the Lord? See the primary, primary place for your affections, for your delight. Overall is your delight in him. You find the most pleasure in him. Next step B, read Psalm 37 this week. Just read the, the whole of, of Psalm 37. Let's pray. And that's all we got for this week. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that all of our delight would be in you. All of our affections would be found in you. That our hearts would align with yours. And our passions and desires would align with yours and that we would pray those desires in our heart and we would see you act, Lord. Help us to commit our way to you. To be more of who you've called each and every one of us to be in our lives, at home, in our work, in our community. When we're just alone with you and honest with you. Just pray to give our hearts over to you. We love you, Lord. And I ask you to lead us not into any temptation, but keep us delivered from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name. Everybody sit. Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great week, and I will see you in a couple weeks.